Welcome to Grappling with the Gray, a forum for promoting the development of an ethical mindset and ethical decision making to help us clearly see both sides of complex issues and better navigate the moral challenges of everyday life. I'm Jonathan Goldson, and I'd like to welcome my guests for this episode. Rachel Druckenmiller is the keynote speaker who sings. Turn, turning burned out, checked out employees into energized, motivated, and connected teams. Sarah Calmetta, aka Sarah the Pivoter, is founder of Pivot Point, a career transition coach, author, and podcast host. And Lester Young is a reentry specialist, founder of Path to Redemption, a member of the Leadership Challenge, the Commission of Minority Affairs, and the Affordable Housing Task Force. Thank you all for joining me today. Good to be here. Blessings to everyone. Now let's jump into today's ethics challenge. In October 2019, a federal judge upheld the right of Harvard University to set a higher standard of admissions criteria for Asian American students and allow entry to a larger number of underrepresented ethnicities, thereby creating a more diverse student population. The case harkened back to the 1978 Bakke decision, which declared racial quotas unconstitutional while, main, while maintaining the constitutionality of affirmative action. On the one hand, there is clear benefit to creating an academic environment in which a diversity of cultures, values, and viewpoints are represented. A variegated student body promotes discussion and debate in a way that a homogenous community cannot. On the other hand, it seems unfair that a university or any organization should have one set of standards for one group and a different set of standards for others. Is that not essentially the same kind of dis discrimination that made the need arise for affirmative action in the first place? So our challenge is to try to better understand how can we practice compassion for historically disadvantaged groups and create diverse environments without unfairly handicapping worthy individuals. The floor is open. <laughs> yeah, who's going? I'll jump in. You know, uh, for me, uh, as for me, I, I come with the with the experience of the lens as someone who's formerly incarcerated, someone who served a certain amount of time inside the prison system. And we see to this very day what is considered the collateral consequences. There's over 48,000 collateral consequences that deny individual majority of their rights. And one of those rights is edu education and occupational licensing. So I believe that we have to, how do we address some of these problems? I think that we have to begin by humanizing the individual and start seeing them as the crime, but seeing them as the human. So like my shirt, it says, I'm human. And it's, it's, it's a sad thing, but I have to always remind people that I am, my felony conviction doesn't define me. It is the choices in which I make today that define who I am, right? And I am a human being that deserves an opportunity for higher education, employment, housing, and different things of that nature. So I'll step back and, you know, let the other panelists share. I think that's a really great point. Um, I'm one to break outside of the box. You know, I think that a lot of times society puts us in these boxes and these labels. And if you think about the book Blink, right, we make <clears throat> snap decisions very quickly based on how a person's dressed, right? What do they look like? Where are they eating? What type of food are they, you know, preparing at home, the books that are on their shelves? And yet that's only a small snapshot. Of the person that we're seeing. It does not define them in totality. We have many different facets, like a diamond, if you will. And so what perspective are we looking at it? And I think adopting the perspective of the human, the whole human, is really important because as you said, you know, and when we start to, you know, the, go back into this subset of people now has a harder admissions process than another subset, we are creating a reverse situation, which maybe right now we feel we're doing it in fairness, but what are the knock-on effects of that 20 years down the line? And so we need to make sure we're looking at that bigger picture and understanding how that will impact society, not just in the short term, but in the long term. Yeah, I think uh, before we get to you, Rachel, this, they, there are always unintended consequences mm -hmm. to programs that want to do good and 
by definition, they're unintended and often unanticipated. So we can't say, well, let's not do anything because it may not work out. On the other hand, when it doesn't work out, we have to be prepared to, as, as your brand tells us, Sarah, to, to pivot and try to figure out how can we strike the best balance, Rachel? I think also it's interesting. I feel like Lester and I are connected today. My shirt today says you matter, which is, I think isn't something inherent <laughs> <laughs> that all of us as humans, I mean, what we're talking about is, you know, when people have opportunities and, and they feel like they have, you know, an equal opportunity, there's a sense of feeling like they matter, which is again, what all of us really ultimately want. You know, I, one of the things that I think would be valuable to do that I don't know has been really done much with a situation like this is to invite these the different groups of people to have a conversation together to say, here's the challenge that we're up against, right? Like I know as a white woman born into a middle-class family that was well-educated, that I had certain privileges and opportunities available to me that other people did not. Like that is a fact. Um, and like, yeah, have I worked hard? Yes, have there certain, and, you know, it's a yes and, and both of those things are true. But I think what might be interesting is if we were to bring together groups of people that are affected by the decision, not just people that are making the decision, because so often it's people that make the decision that aren't necessarily affected by it, <laughs> um, which presents a really significant issue. I believe that people are naturally, I'm reading a book right now called The Book of Joy. Um, it's an interview with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, a really wonderful book. Um, and, and essentially one of the key tenets of the book is that we're wired, we're wired left to our own devices, really we are wired to be compassionate and collaborative. And so often there's this message that society presents that we need to be divided. And, and I think if you were to bring a group of people together and invite them to explore, so here's the challenge that we're, that we're up against. Um, what do you think, if you were in this situation, what would you do? And then inviting students to be put into those situations and to hear, the, to hear another side. And I bet that if we did something like that, that we'd arrive at something that would acknowledge, to Lester's point, the, our shared humanity more than what I think a lot of times can happen is there can be more division that happens as a result of things like this. And you remind me, uh, Rachel, of a um, story I heard recently. There was a company that they, um, it may have been during COVID, I don't remember, but uh, for whatever external reasons, they could not continue to keep their workforce and pay them. Uh, it simply wasn't feasible when the company would not survive. So they were looking at a situation, what do we do? Do we keep everybody and go broke or do we ax a certain number of jobs? And someone came up with the idea that we promote heavily in, in, on this program, uh, which is don't look at things in a binary way. Maybe there are other options that we can discover if we look for them. And they actually did exactly what you just said, Rachel. They, they brought the employees together and they asked them, they explained the situation and they said, how much of a pay cut would you be willing to take for us to be able to keep everyone working in this company? Mm -hmm. And they ended up with people accepting more than they were planning on asking them mm -hmm. because everyone felt like this is a calls for teamwork. This calls for collective sacrifice. And everyone was included in the decision-making process. So they, gave, they got that sense of empowerment. The company turned around in a relatively short time and was able to then restore full compensation to all its workers. The complicated part is not every situation is comparable. And in a situation like this, where you're having to choose, let's say, go back to the college situation, you're having to choose which students to admit, it may not be feasible to get everybody in the same room. But I think your point is well taken that, that it really comes down to communication and transparency, both of which become buzzwords, but both of which I think contain a lot of truth. Lester, did you have something? Yeah, I was just thinking too, like, like I said, just coming speaking from my lens of my lived experiences, this is a challenge I, I deal with 
consistently in this space around helping those with felony conviction get get uh, accepted into higher education platforms, right? That is a big challenge. So now you're you're black, you're Asian, you're indigenous from, from that indigenous population of individuals, but you're still now living with this scarlet letter, which is called a felony, and that's all a person sees. They see your color, and then they look and they see this thing where it says, check this box, and you check this box, and you never get an opportunity to, to really get a chance to know these individuals. So to Rachel's point, I believe that those who are closest to the problem have the solutions, but in most cases are denied the opportunity to sit at the table where the decisions are made. So when we're talking about how do we rectify problems is that we have to be able to have this empathy level, apply this level of empathy to begin to allow those who are living with the experiences to be able to share their story so that we can get a better understanding of it, right? So when like one of the things that I do too is advocate for ban the box policy around employment opportunities, right? When we're talking about people in our society, not only higher education, but just simple thing is employment, housing, there's a box that says, have you been convicted of a felony? And most people, when they check that box, they're denied not only education, they're denied the basic things of housing, uh, as well as uh, employment opportunities. So I just think that we have to come from the lens of empathy and be able to have a conversation to begin to unpack our unconscious bias, the things that we are not even aware that it's there because of what we've been exposed to, begin to address that so that we can start seeing each other in a more kind and more compassionate way. I would agree with that. I mean, if you look at our, our court system and our justice system, it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, right? And that's for that particular case, but that should not be a brand for the rest of your life. I mean, think about the things that we all did when we were kids or when we were teenagers, right? There's, there's often a very problematic toddler and they say no all the time and they're really frustrating, but does that mean they're like that for the rest of their life? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You know, as you said, uh, Lester, it's really about what are the experiences this person has been exposed to and what kind of compassion was extended to them? What kind of trust? I find, um, you know, I worked in Asia for 13 years and what often happens because there's a high power distance, which means that between the lowest and the highest person in an organization, mm -hmm. if someone in power or perceived power gives advice, it's perceived as instruction. It's not a suggestion. It's, I've said, oh, what about this? That means I want you to do it, right? And that's how they interpret the information. And so really understanding that about the people that you're working with will also help put that into the right context. You know, what came to mind as you were speaking uh, as well was, you know, that show the voice where the panel, the judges are facing, you know, one direction, they hear the singing behind them and they don't get a chance to look at the person to make any snap judgment or have a subconscious bias come into play. Now, of course, from a college admission standpoint, that might be a bit more difficult to put into practice and scale, but do we have to check a box? Can we not be entered in based on merit and you know, different qualifications? I think that our success metrics are broken and they need to be redesigned for the where we want to go. They worked very well when we were in factory settings and it was you know, information in, information out in a very rote way, but that's not the way of the world anymore. Mm. There's a, um, if, we, if we take your, your point, Lester, about empathy, and we turn it around to this case, what about empathy for, in this case, uh, the, the Asian student mm -hmm. who, is, who has all the qualifications that the university requires mm -hmm. and is told, well, you're not, we're not able to take you. Mm -hmm. So that Asian student may have empathy for people who come from backgrounds that are disadvantaged, mm -hmm. but I still want to go to this college. I still feel qualified. <laughs> I, why am I, as an individual, being penalized for a collective problem? What do we say to that student? <laughs> That's a heavy, I mean, I don't want to take all the space in the room. So I'll step back. Rachel, uh, you wanted to add to that? So like nobody promised life was going to be fair. I mean, like, I know, <laughs> I don't mean to be a jerk about it, but like whoever told you life was fair, like life's not fair. I mean, yeah. and, and I mean, I would validate that like, it's really like, if I were that student, I'd be really 
frustrated. Like, well, what more can I do? You'd be in left in a feeling of being like, well, what more could I have done? Mm -hmm. Nothing other than been born different. It's like, well, I can't control that, <laughs> you know? And so I think to Sarah's point, it would be really interesting to the extent that you could do things as blind as blind admissions and um the tricky part would be if there's an advantage in some way in terms of um i don't know if there's any other you know if someone's looking at we again as to your point about unconscious bias we're going to make certain judgments about oh this person's in these extracurriculars got it i'm telling myself a story about who that person is so it's like even if you did make it blind like we're still going to throw our bias into it anyway um, I mean, I, I would imagine that I would feel that I, that I would feel very frustrated as somebody who's like a high achiever and like really pushes myself hard and, and, you know, but I can tell Lester you're chomping a bit and you're going to say something <laughs> for it. <laughs> oh, look, I mean, I'm looking at it from the, again, I'm coming with my lived experience as a black male who was already dealing with a level of racism prior to walking out of prison with a felony conviction. So I can understand an Asian person trying to enter into a space that and then being rejected. So my thing would be that I have learned is be now take that energy and become an advocate for that change. Like when we look at any social challenges in our society, when a door was closed on young black people and say they were not able to enter into a school, they became individuals, became organized and advocated to get a law passed, right? So I would not just say, hey, be a, you know, you have it. I would say now use that intelligence and that energy and let's organize and advocate for policies and laws to change so that you and those who come after you can have an opportunity to experience that. So you think about like if, if, if my ancestors didn't advocate for us to go to school, when we were being denied to go to school because of the color of our skin, where we be as a nation right now as far as black race and people as far as education. So that energy was taken to the streets and became and they became organized around this issue. So that would be my suggestion to the Asian woman is that mm -hmm. take your energy and become an advocate, get a law passed, find ways to, to get involved in the elected process so that we can change these particular bias bills that are in place that is denying you accessibility to higher education. Mm -hmm. You know what I think would be a really interesting um, experience is when, when you look at an organization, there's a lot of on the job training and there's cross cross departmental training that takes place right because you want the departments to understand the other stakeholders, how do they work together. What is it like from their side of the fence right you know if I hold up this book to you and I say what color is it I wasn't on a camera able to look at it and you tried to tell me, you know what the color is. Like, tell me right now, what color do you see? Blue. blue. Right, but I'm going to sit here and say, I don't see blue, I see white. Convince me that it's blue. Um, so unless I have you come around and stand behind me, you don't see that. And I don't see what you see. So can we find a way to actually have more, you know, community crossover within, whether it's a culture, a school system, so that we understand that experience? Because... We just don't know what we don't know. You know, when I went to Asia for the first time, watching American politics play out on news channels was extremely interesting because I was like, oh, this is how the rest of the world sees it. This is fascinating. And then I was able to understand uh, what was going on from a different perspective that I just, you know, I could never see before. And especially now social media, right? The algorithm feeds you more of what you click on and what you like and how your eyes track and all this really scary stuff. <laughs> so how can we have more interaction amongst communities where it, it is this invitation to connect and share and go through that experience? Because, you know, my experience going over there I experienced white privilege as an expat. I also experienced racism because I was not Chinese, you know? And so it was a very interesting space to be in and just to kind of watch these social dynamics play out and to get a taste of what that feels like so that I could have more compassion and empathy mm -hmm. and realize the way I send a message is not always how it lands and how often does that take place? So how can we bring this into our school systems, not just at college level, but at the beginning so that this conversation happens at a much earlier stage so that it's not even 
an issue. I mean, of course, we'll have other issues that come up, again, unintended consequences, but it will allow us to pave the way for better connection. Rachel, I know you spend a lot of time in the uh, HR space. Um, do you see um, expressions of this kind of tension of policies that are intended to solve problems that end up creating resentments or frustrations? I mean, it's unrelated to this topic, but I mean, look at what's happening with work from home. People that are like, you must go into the office and we're doing that to preserve our culture, but then people are ticked off at us and nobody wants to come in. So it's sabotaging our culture. And then we dig our heels in because somebody at the top decided that you have to see somebody in order to prove that they're getting their job done. Um, yes, I, I see that everywhere. Um, interestingly, you know, and I work a lot with groups that are in really technical industries. So I work a lot with folks that are in accounting, engineering, um, healthcare, scientific research, and then also with like education and other just, you know, kind of a wide range of um, IT consulting. And what I find is, and this is going back to two things that Sarah and Lester both said, is it really at the core, when we create more space for story and shift from, from numbers to stories, I think people are more inclined to make more compassionate decisions. Because if you understand a number that like the, the person behind the number, then you're more inclined to, I think, have a more, have an approach that's more granular. You know what I mean? That, that it allows for that, that gray space. Like if we heard a story, for instance, if we invited people to share stories from, from all different angles that we're talking about, like if you invited a student to share who would have otherwise not had that opportunity, who was equally qualified, but maybe not as well connected, because so much of it, I mean, if anyone's watched the documentary on college admission scandal, yeah. huh, that is <laughs> disturbing to say the least. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like what a mess, you know? Um, and it's just these people paying people off. That's all it. And you're watching this and you're like, oh my gosh, like I had, I had no idea that it was at this level, you know, and somebody who doesn't have those connections has no chance, you know, and I think also the way that universities are funded, right, is they're, they're looking at that at donors to come from alums that are well off. <laughs> so it's like the whole structure we're looking at the, it, it's sort of like the band aid versus like addressing the whole illness. Yeah. It's like this is a, this is a larger systemic issue with when you're talking about how things are funded and that those decisions are connected to ultimately funding these places of higher education you know so it's like that's a whole other can of worms that could be opened up but i think when we look at it in this really narrow lens and we say we're meeting quotas or you know trying to get to this number, we're just missing the bigger picture that like those things are happening inside of a system that's already dis highly dysfunctional. <laughs> yes. But, you know, my question would be is what's the fear? Why, what is the fear? Because there's a fear that we deny people accessibility or something. So what is that fear for, you go back into the, what's the fear of this Asian woman or young woman going into a school? What's the fear of a black male or someone from the Afro-American race to go into a school? What's the fear of for HR hiring someone with a felony conviction? What's that fear? You know, I think that when we really like script that down and find out, it's really fear is a thing that is holding us back from making the decision and going back to get into our biases. So the bias is what is that? I think that we have to begin to address those things. So going back again to storytelling, one of the things that I, I, I found that was very powerful in HR and in sharing lived experience is storytelling. When someone is able to tell their story and why they want to apply for a college, right? They may be the first person in their family that ever had an opportunity to go to school and given them a greater opportunity to build a family, to live out the American dream, because education is part of that. When you hear that story, now we have someone listening with a level of empathy and they can see the value in that. And they don't no longer see the gender, the race, the ethnicity. They now see a person with a story that want to buy into the same dream you buy it into. And that's they want to be able to build a family and, and be able to have wealth and education is one of those part of that. So I think that that's, those are the two things that I would ask anyone is one, what is your fear? 
what do you really fear? Script that down and you'll come to find that your fear is not even real. It's, it's a part of this imagination, this boogeyman that the media and other things that you listen to have shaped that fear. And it's really when you open the closet, it's nobody there. So you really don't, it shouldn't be a fear there, right? But you gotta have that deep conversation with yourself to say, why do I fear allowing this person to go to school? Why do I fear this person from getting a job? It's nothing really there. When we look at data, an Asian person going to school is not going to make the school unsafe, right? Uh, how a person with a felony conviction is not going to make a school unsafe, nor a workplace unsafe. So it's really come down to what do you fear and then understanding and addressing your unconscious, bi un unconscious bias. And I think that once you start address scripting yourself down there, now you'll be able to be able to apply empathy and understand the story of the individuals and why they want to do what they do. I really like what you brought up there, Lester, because, you know, fear is really just false evidence appearing real. It's a nice acronym for everyone to remember for fear. And it is just a story. So just as powerful as story connects us and binds us and creates that community, it's also the story that stories that can separate us if we are not willing to take the blinders off and just, you know, turn the light on. Very often, that's all we need to do. You know, it come, brings to mind, there's a video you can very easily find on the internet of a little kid that thinks it's drowning, screaming, and the mom just laughs and like stands him up and the water's like that deep, right? Wow. But he's holding onto something, thinking that he's, you know, in this really deep water. And that's very often the situations we find ourselves in. You know, I think, the real fears are just those root fears of we don't want to be rejected or abandoned by our own communities. And then in response to that, we project and we end up rejecting and abandoning others. So how can we soothe that for ourselves so that we can be in a space where we can hear each other's story and connect over that? Yeah, I also think that like if I wouldn't say this would be true universally, but I do believe that if people heard a story of somebody who's had a different lived experience that maybe didn't have as much privilege or opportunity. I think that there would be certain people that would say like, take my spot. Like, I, I really think the goodness in humanity, and I really do inherently believe in the goodness of humanity. I do, there, there is a lot of not goodness, but I think at our, I think at our core that I, I think that pe people are inherently like good. Yeah. And so I think if you were to set up a scenario where someone got to hear, you know, a story of somebody and that like did everything they could to you know break through all the things that all the obstacles that were in their way um societal obstacles um you know financial obstacles you know that there would be certain people that would that would i think become quite generous and say i want like i realized that i had this opportunity more easily than you and i want I'm not saying this would be like universally true, but I do think that there would be some of that that would happen if people just heard each other's stories more and really understood where other people were coming from. And then that's, you know, we're just at the end of the first segment, um, but I think it's a night, you've tied things off nicely uh, because on the one hand, you ask about fear. So much of fear comes from living in a community where there's a sense of being adversarial and it's us against them. And certainly we mentioned this, that our media does a wonderful job of perpetuating this sense that we are all out to get each other. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's toxic and it's caustic. And, and I think you're right, Rachel. And I think the story we told of the, the corporation that, that asked employees um, what they would be willing to do. When you create a sense of community, of common purpose, of collaboration, then we are willing to sacrifice for one another. And, and we don't even necessarily see it as a sacrifice. We see it as that's the way the world works. That's the way the world should work. Um, and so on the one hand, we're looking at, we've got to look at the big picture and then we've got to have the individual story and, and try to synthesize the, the macro and the micro. Uh, to the point where we all feel that we are working together mm -hmm. and at the same time to provide options for people. If we say to someone, okay, well, you can't go to the, your first choice college. Good luck. <laughs> well, that's not a very encouraging message. <laughs> Whereas it's, 
okay, there are there's a larger picture here. Why other candidates are a better fit for the totality of the student body, but here are some other options, and you'll have you'll have a, a priority getting into your second choice, your third choice. There, there are ways in which systemically we can create more trust and more sense of common ground. And, and, that's, and then of course, the question that we perhaps will dive into in the next uh, segment is when we, we come up with these sort of universal vision of uh, what ought to be, uh, what can we as individuals do to implement that? But, uh, but for the moment, uh, I would like to thank all of you, uh, Rachel Trotten Miller, Sarah Calmetta, and Lester Young for joining me. Um, and for those of you who are watching or listening, if you'd like to suggest an ethical scenario or dilemma for discussion, please go to my website, jonasmcoltson.com, and use the contact box to submit your proposal. Uh, if it's something compelling, we'll be happy to take it up. If you are a Grappling with the Gray member, please use the community link to participate in a follow-up Q&A and continued discussion. If you're not a member, please go to gwtg.live. That's gwtg.live, where you can sign up for a free 30-day trial and enjoy member benefits. Please join us again next week for another ethical discussion as our panel grapples with the gray. <laughs>